the first work of art as immediate is abstract and individual. As for itself, it has to move away from this immediate and objective mode towards self-consciousness. While self-consciousness, on the other hand, in the cult, aims at getting rid of the distinction by which it distinguishes itself at first from its spirit, and by doing so to produce a work of art which is in its own self animate. Paragraph 705 is a very short introductory lead-in to this new subsection, the abstract work of art, which figures into this second subsection of religion, religion in the form of art, where we're going to be turning to look particularly at Greek religion. And you notice that there's some, some references here, if you've read ahead in the text, to what is coming up. So, for, for example, um, at the very end of this uh, short paragraph, producing a work of art which is in its own self animate. Now, the word animate there could perhaps distract you a little bit. The next section is the living work of art, right? And the German here, an ihm selbst belebt, uh, in itself living or lively, it, you know. Here, the, the term that Miller has chosen, animate, it works, but it doesn't quite convey to you that we are talking about the living work of art. And what is going to be happening in this section, we're moving away from, as we're beginning here, the first work of art, which has these particular characteristics we'll talk about in just a moment, into something that is a more adequate vehicle of spirit. And what does that mean to be a vehicle of, of spirit? Something that is going to be mediating and mediating in complex ways and mediating for self-consciousness. Remember back to the beginning of this religion section where Hegel brought up these terms, consciousness and self-consciousness, and, and was saying that, you know, we're bringing these together along with whatever has been achieved in reason and spirit. So there's actually quite a lot being referenced here in this short little passage. And we begin at another beginning. The first work of art as immediate, unmittelbaren, right? Not just unmediated, but immediate, uh, is abstract, he says, and individual. Now, individual, that's kind of an interesting thing to say, isn't it? Given how much stress Hegel has placed on the individual as the locus of agency and driving, sometimes of evil as well, and this constant need for reconciling the universal and the individual um, why would the individual be abstract? Well, that's something we're going to have to see worked out in the next few paragraphs. Abstract, okay, that makes perfect sense, right? It is immediate, it's abstract, it's sort of like sense certainty, where we began in the work itself and where we keep on beginning over and over again. By now, you're probably used to the Hegelian shtick, which is that we begin with something that appears to be unmediated, right? Appears to be abstract, appears to be just what it is, being in itself, and then we find out, we unpack it, and there's much more going on, right? What else is happening here? So he tells us that as for itself, on its side, right? It has to move away from this, as he calls it, immediate and objective. Objective here is gegenständliche existing in the form of an object, right? It has to move away from this immediate and objective mode towards self-consciousness. What is the it, the work of art? How does the work of art do that? Through self-consciousness. And self-consciousness per se, self-consciousness from the beginning of the self-consciousness section, or uh, the part of the self-consciousness section that would seem to be more immediately applicable to this, the unhappy consciousness? No, self-consciousness, as Hegel says, in the cult, the cultus. And here I think it's, it's quite important for the contemporary reader 
that we pause for a moment and clarify the meaning of this word cult, because I think for many people in, in this time, it means something like a very uh, uh, tight-knit community that is in many ways heterodox, not only to its own society, but to uh, what we might call more traditional or, or mainstream religion. And it has a, a tendency to you know, deform the personalities of those who belong to it. Often there's like a beloved leader who turns out to be kind of a scummy, almost always guy, but sometimes woman as well. Okay, put that aside because that is a contemporary use of the term, but what we mean by cult in religious studies or within philosophy, particularly in Hegel's time, is the community of worship. So a community of worship could be a cult in the very late modern sense, but any other community of worship, you know, the Buddhist Sangha, the Catholic Church, uh, you know, the uh, Hindu community of Vaishnavites, all of those would be examples of cults in the sense that Hegel is using this term, as would be the communities of worship centered around Greek temples, festivals, um, as we're going to see a little bit later with their own literature. So all of that would be part of the cult as Hegel is talking about. It. So self-consciousness develops not only within, we might say, secular communities or within the family or within relations between people, but also within these religious frameworks and matrices. And so he says, self-consciousness in the cult aims at getting rid of the distinction by which it distinguishes itself at first from spirit, right? Now, getting rid of this distinction is, is a form of overcoming, right? Of uh, Aufheben, here it's Aufzuheben, right? And so it's, it's trying to get rid of this hard distinction that is separating itself from its own spirit. And it's going to do something. It's going to take the work of art, the first work of art, and transform it into something new. That's not going to happen right away. There's going to be a number of steps and stages, but by the end of this section, that's where we're going. Producing a work of art, which is in its own self animate. An ihm selbst belebte, right? So in its, in its very nature, in its activity, in its agency, it is something that has life, that, that exhibits liveliness. That's where we're going in this section. So Hegel's, you know, sketching the road out in front of us. The first mode in which the artistic spirit keeps its shape and its active consciousness farthest apart is the immediate mode. That is, the shape is there or is immediately present simply as a thing. In this mode, the shape is broken up into the distinction of individuality, which bears within it the shape of the self, and of universality, which represents the inorganic essence, in reference to the shape, its environment, and habitation. This shape, through the raising of the whole into the pure notion, acquires its pure, spiritually appropriate form. It is neither the crystal, the form characteristic of the understanding, which houses the dead or is illumined by a soul outside of it, nor is it that blending of the forms of nature and of thought which first emerge from the plant, thought's activity in this being still an imitation. On the contrary, the notion strips off the traces of root branches and leaves still adhering to the forms and purifies the latter into shapes in which the crystal straight lines and flat surfaces are raised into incommensurable ratios so that the ensoulment of the organic is taken up into the abstract form of the understanding and at the same time its essential nature incommensurability is preserved for the understanding. Paragraph 706 is charting out uh, an important movement that Hegel is narrating for us that runs through the next paragraph. And you could think of paragraph 706 
and 707 as sort of, I suppose the word would be what, diptych as opposed to triptych, when we have paintings, two paintings together, rather than a sequence of three. And, you know, talking in visual terms like that is, is quite important because we can see that in this early part of this section, the uh, abstract work of art, we are talking about visual representation. Hegel is going to be getting us beyond that within the framework of the community of worship or the cult uh, fairly shortly. And this paragraph is centered almost entirely on visual representation, tracing out some of the, the movements that we saw earlier in the religion section, in the introduction, and in the um, natural religion section as well. So what do we have going on here? He says, the first mode in which the artistic spirit keeps its shape and its active consciousness farthest apart is the immediate mode. That is the mode that we were just talking about at the beginning of this section in paragraph 705, right? So artistic spirit, spirit in that's working through art and active consciousness, the self-consciousness that is not supposed to be separated from spirit, but which, which is, uh, is in this immediate mode. He says the shape is there or immediately present simply as a thing. So what are we talking about in terms of this shape? The object... We, which we could say the object of worship or the object mediating worship, the object that allows us to connect with the divine that represents it in some way, houses it is another way of thinking about it, as we're going to talk about in just a, a moment, the vehicle of the divine for us, the religious worshipers, the members of the, the cultists, right? And there are going to be two key aspects to this. He says um, the, the shape, the gestalt, is broken up into the distinction of individuality and universality. Individuality, he says, um, bears within it the shape of the self. So we're seeing shape showing up twice, right? We've got the shape as such, and then we've got the shape of the self. What self? Well, the self of the God, but it could also be the self of the worker. And through a process of identification, it could also be our own self identifying with the self of the, the God. And then we have this side of universality where he says something quite interesting. It represents the inorganic essence, the Inorganisha, Wesen, right? Wesen can mean being, it can mean essence, it's something that is important. And, and this is much more in the shape of the thing than is the shape of the self. The self, as we've seen in previous paragraphs, negativity inhabits that. This is positivity. And we saw that earlier in the previous section as well, this dialectic between uh, negativity and positivity, right? So the inorganic essence in reference to the shape. So in reference to, related to the shape, in bezug, right, uh, the, of the shape. So which, which side is the shape on? Well, it's on both. You have to have both of these polarities together. Um, but... The universal is, in some respects, less driving, right? It, it, it's more important in a way, I guess, because it's universal and it has the essence. But, you know, he goes on and he says two interesting things here. So how does it represent the inorganic essence in reference to the shape? Miller translates these terms as environment and habitation. That works, I think. Umwelt would be another uh, term that we would translate as environment, which we're not seeing here. Umgebung, its surroundings, would be another way of translating this, right? Its surroundings, its environment, and its habitation, its behausung, its setting, you know, where, where it's being placed. Now, where is the cult image going? That's where we should think for a bit, right? It, we're not just talking about mere embellishment around, say, a temple or a shrine. We're talking about the thing that's 
in the temple or shrine, the thing that centers it. When you would go into an ancient temple, um, a lot of people don't really realize this. You were very often they were called the house of the God and you're entering into a space that is set apart from the rest of the environment that you're in. And you're entering a, a different environment, a different housing here, a different setting as the worshiper. And in a way you belong less there than the statue or the image or whatever it is of the God does. And this goes, we could, we could, you know, do a cross-cultural analysis of this. It doesn't just have to be Greek temples. You could think about Mesopotamian temples. You could think about Egyptian temples. You could think about, you know, uh, Chinese, Indian. We could go all over the place and look at statuary and artwork. And there's, there's, you know, there's artwork going into it as well. It's very rare that things are just, well, there's the image of the God and then everything else is just architecture. No, there's all, all sorts of interesting embellishments. We could carry this forward even perhaps into thinking about the medieval cathedrals centered on the crucifix, but with all of this other stuff along the way and entering in, again into a, a sacred space that provides an environment and a habitation. Now, Hegel here, as I mentioned in uh, paragraph 706, is not going to look at all the possible forms that the visual representation could take. Here, he's really only talking about um, two of them, the plant and the crystal. And we encountered these earlier in natural religion, right? So he goes on and he says, here we go. This shape through the raising of the whole into the pure notion, the pure concept, acquires its pure spiritually appropriate form. Now, does it acquire it in this paragraph? No. That's going to happen by the end of the next paragraph. He says, it is neither the crystal, the form characteristic of the understanding, the Verstand, a human faculty, right? Which houses the dead or is illumined by a soul outside of it. We saw that dynamic play out again back in natural religion. So it's not that. It's also, he says, uh, not that blending of the forms of nature and of thought, Gedanka, which first emerged from the plant, thoughts, activity in this being, still an imitation, right? An imitation of what? Of, of the floral, uh, vine-like, you know, leaf-like, whatever else it happens to be. Uh, forms that we're, we're working with, which are, um, you know, an advance beyond the crystal, we can certainly say. And he says, no, no, what we have here going on, the notion, the concept that's driving this, strips off the traces of root branches and leaves still adhering to the forms and purifies the latter into shapes in which the crystal straight lines and flat surfaces are raised into incommensurable, and he's using that term there, incommensurable, right? Ratios, connections, right? So that the ensoulment of the organic is taken up into the abstract form of the understanding, and at the same time, its essential nature, which is what? Incommensurability, incommensurabilitat in German, is preserved for the understanding. So it's still the understanding doing the heavy lifting here, but it's being confronted with something that is going to go beyond it. And we should pause for a moment on this word incommensurability. What does that actually mean? So if you look at it literally, right, the come means together with, right? Uh, mensurability is coming from mensura, measure, so things that cannot be, the in, of course, not measured together, not measured by the same measure together, that means they don't connect up. It's sort of like if you ever had Legos and then you had like off-brand Lego bricks that weren't actually Legos. Like when I was a kid, we had bricks blocks, right? Which you could buy cheaply at the store. Legos were expensive. They were very much modeled after each other. Of course, the bricks blocks were a bit cheaper plastic. They were more, you know, uh, breakable and they were slightly bigger than the Legos. Not so much in length and width, but depth. So you couldn't actually get them to stick together. 
You can either work with your, your bricks blocks or you can work with your Legos and they looked very similar to each other. Although Legos came in many colors, bricks blocks only came in the set that I had in red, white, and blue. Um, and so, you know, you had your Legos and then your, your cheap imitation. They were not commensurable with each other. We could talk about other kinds of incommensurability as well. When you try to take uh, music that's set in a certain meter and time and transpose it into another setting, maybe they won't actually fit together. And when it comes to the life of the mind and religion and all that, incommensurability may in fact be the case quite often. It's also the case uh, quite often for artistic representation. And so this incommensurability for the understanding is going to turn out to be quite important. Hegel's not going to mention it so much, but it's there in the background. What is it that that spirit in the form of the understanding at this point cannot yet assimilate to itself and which is going to make it grow in order to be able to stretch itself into that kind of shape. That's the, the movement ahead of us. But the indwelling God is the black stone drawn forth from its animal covering and pervaded with the light of consciousness. The human form strips off the animal shape with which it was blended. The animal is for the God merely an accidental guise. It steps alongside its true shape and no longer has any worth on its own account, but is reduced to signifying something else and is sunk to the level of a mere symbol. By this very fact, the shape of the God in its own self strips off also the poverty of the natural conditions of animal existence and hints at the internal dispositions of animal life melted into its surface and belonging only to this surface. The essential being of the God is, however, the unity of the universal existence of nature and of self-conscious spirit, which in its actuality confronts the former. At the same time, being in the first instance an individual shape, its existence is one of the elements of nature, just as its self-conscious actuality is an individual national spirit. But the former is, in this unity, that element reflected into spirit, nature transfigured by thought and united with self-conscious life. The form of the gods has, therefore, its nature element within it as a transcended moment, as a dim memory. The chaotic being and confused strife of the freely existing elements, the unethical realm of the titans, is conquered and banished to the fringes of an actuality that has become transparent to itself, to the obscure boundaries of the world which finds itself in the sphere of spirit and is there at peace. These ancient gods, firstborn children of the union of light with darkness, heaven, earth, ocean, sun, the earth's blind tymphonic fire, and so on, are supplanted by shapes which only dimly recall those titans and which are no longer creatures of nature, but lucid ethical spirits of self-conscious nations. In paragraph 707, as in the previous paragraph, we see a partial retracing of the steps in natural religion, but now we're going beyond it. We're going to exceed that and to bring up incommensurability again, which is not referenced in this paragraph, but was in the last one. We're, we're launching into something that doesn't map onto the previous development, the previous <clears throat> dialectical chain that we saw in that earlier subsection, right? So Hegel begins by talking about the black stone, and he's not going to go very far into this. He says the indwelling God is the black stone drawn forth. So it's no longer just inhabiting that. It's not a crystalline structure. It's not a, you know, uh, sort of absurd or uh, contentless thing that we're just... Uh, 
confronted with. Instead, we've got the animal form, right? He says, it's drawn forth from its animal covering, pervaded with the light of consciousness. And, and we saw that in the previous natural religion section, after the crystalline structure, after the discussion of, of plant, we have discussion of animals. And animals can be sort of like totems. There's also, as we saw at the very end of the discussion of the, um, the worker, there is this blending of animal and human forms. Uh, a lot of people see that as a reference to Egyptian depictions of the gods. And he says the human form strips off the animal shape with which it was blended. So this animality, this fusion of animal and human forms, that is going to be left behind. Instead, the animal can be turned into a mere symbol. So perhaps animals can accompany the gods. They can be identified as uh, important to this particular god as the, the peacock was to Hera, for example. Uh, there's always going to be a narrative there or you know, maybe the eagle to Zeus, or you know, pick whatever sea animal you want to, to Poseidon or Neptune, and we could go on and on. But there's also um, you know, plants that are important to particular deities. We, we might also think about you know, the lion skin associated with, with Hercules. Uh, these are mere symbols. They don't convey the fullness of, of what the god is he says the animal is for the god merely an accidental guise it steps alongside its true shape and no longer has any worth on its own account so the animal no longer has any worth on its own account it is reduced to signifying something else and is sunk to the level of a mere symbol symbols nothing wrong with them it's just that they don't convey the concept they don't convey what is really there, they gesture at it, they hint at it, right? So Hegel is taking a position on religion that a lot of other people who are much more enamored of symbols probably are not going to go down that route, you know? And that's just the way it is. You kind of pay your money and take your chances, as a friend of mine used to say all the time. So he, he goes on and he says, the essential being of the God is... The unity of the universal existence of nature, right? So that's one side, the universal existence, Dasein, of, of nature and of self-conscious spirit, which in its actuality confronts the former, confronts this universal existence of nature. So already in here in the Hegelian dynamic, we have nature versus culture emerging out of nature, but, but transcending it, being incommensurable with it, to bring up that term one more time, right? So how is this going to play itself out? Well, this is where we get to another possibility, the Titanic gods, the gods of a past who were worshipped, feared, talked about, but who couldn't provide really what a, a nation required. So he says, um, here we go. The form of the gods has therefore its nature element within it as a transcendent moment. That is the Titanic gods. The nature element is present within those. And by the time that we actually get, say, written testimony about this or um, some sort of self-conscious understanding, these gods are already in the past deities, whatever you want to call them, spirits. So he goes on and he says, the chaotic being and confused strife of the freely existing elements, he doesn't mean elements in a chemical sense, right? He does mean elements in the sense of the things that things, um, you know, the, the basic stuff of the, the universe, of nature, they war against each other. They don't fit into a common schema. They jockey for position. And if we think about what are the, the titans, right? So we have this chaotic, confused strife, an unethical realm, unzitlika, right? It's not constrained by ethics in the sort of full-blown sense that we have today where we could, might teach it in classes and talk about rules or anything like that. It's not even uh, really in, in the, the classic sense of Zitlika. There's no customs. There's no MO, modus operandi, right? There's no agreed upon things going on. The Titans fight against each other, you know? 
except for maybe like Prometheus, who knows to get the hell out of the way. But most of the Titans are these barbaric, crazy beings, you know? And we start out with, uh, as he mentions, right? What are these? These ancient gods, firstborn children of the union of light with darkness, heaven, earth, ocean, sun, the earth's blind symphonic fire, right? What, what is that referring to? Think about the volcanic activity and earthquakes and things like that, right? All of these features of the natural environment that are not just plant, animal, crystalline structures, but are all the other things, the crazy winds that blow, uh, mountaintops, anything that is really remarkable and powerful could be a titan in that sense. And there is no, there's no ethical realm here. In a certain sense, when we talk about something as being titanic, we mean it's in a certain way, not just non-human, but anti-human. Human Human beings have to exist in relation to it. And that thing, it might care about humans. Maybe it'll eat them. Maybe it'll crush them. Maybe it'll reward them. Who knows what it's going to do? It's it's irrational. So we've got these titanic gods, right? And he says that this unethical realm of the titans is what? Conquered and banished to the fringes, to the fringes, to the, to the, the backstory and the backwaters of an actuality that has become transparent to itself. What is this actuality? That of, in, in Greek terms, the Olympian gods, Zeus and Hera, you know, the, the big six to start with, who escaped uh, their titanic father uh, by means of the help of their titanic mother, Kronos, was devouring all of his children, right? And so he ate up the, the, the three boys and the three girls. He didn't actually eat up uh, Zeus, who one of the boys, because uh, he ate a stone in its place, right? And then Zeus is brought up and they get him to, to throw up all these, these gods. And you get, you know, Hera, Demeter, uh, Hestia, right? And then you get the three boys, uh, Hades, Poseidon, Zeus, and they fight a battle. They fight a war against the Titans and they banish them. And the Titans aren't just Kronos, uh, who, by the way, you know, did a terrible thing to his dad, right? Uh, Uranos. It's also the hundred handed ones and the Cyclopses and all, all these sorts of things, right? Including Typhoon. So. What we have as a replacement is this actuality transparent to itself, the six Olympian gods, and then their children, or, you know, even demigod. Well, I mean, Heracles, okay, is, is really technically a demigod who becomes a god, at least in, in some of the, the ways in which things are framed. But Apollo and Artemis and Hermes and, you know, all have, you know, Hephaestus, Ares, Aphrodite, right? All of them become part of this, like he says, actuality transparent to itself. The Greeks know where these gods stand in relation to each other because these gods have relations to each other that are charted out and worshipped in in many different places. So he goes on and he says, um, the chaotic being and confused strife is conquered and banished, right? Uh, To the obscure boundaries of the world which finds itself in the sphere of spirit and is there at peace, These ancient gods are supplanted by shapes which only dimly recall these titans. And here's the key thing. They are no longer creatures of nature, but lucid, clara, ethical spirits of self-conscious nations, Fulker. Now notice that he doesn't say of a nation, but nations, Greek city-states that are going to war against each other. And perhaps even, we might even think of them, because the Greeks thought of it this way, as uh, pertaining to non-Greek but close to Greek people, like, say, the Trojans, right? Or peoples in, in other places as well. So we have a transformation of the understanding of the deities, the gods going on. And this is what he calls nature transfigured by thought, verklärte, uh, clarified, um, made into something new, united, geinte, with self-conscious life. So we have an advance in the understanding of the divine and thereby on the part of the humanity, the self-conscious human beings, part of uh, an ethical community, part of a people or a nation, part of a religious community, the cult, 
uh, a transformation of them in relation to whatever it is that they're taking as divine. 